I'm Brian Oakley. I'm uh, a master's student at the University of Rhode Island. Um, I'm getting my master's in environmental science with a focus in sustainable agriculture. Basically what I've been doing for my project is going around to different farms in New England, looking how they do things, um, and then taking that uh, information back and I'm going to process it and write a paper based on what other people are doing around the country. Farming is actually being a steward of the land and the animals. So if you put sustainable into it, it means being a good steward and be able to make a profit. Being a good steward means making sure that you don't have manure runoff, uh, that your animals are healthy, and that they're humanely cared for. And if you take care of them, they'll respond and take care of you. The cows that we have, we've tried to engineer them to be you know, super animals. They live off high, uh, high grain diets, produce tons of milk, put on body fat and uh, muscle very, very quickly. You know, they're naturally developed over millions of years to graze on grass, have land. Um, not saying that you can't uh, supplement them with grain, but in a lot of ways, it's not as healthy for them. In the older sustainable farming situations, the cows took a little bit longer to grow, but the meat is healthier, the milk is healthier, they don't have uh, hormones or anything like that. Uh, my name is Don Minto, and I'm the farm manager at the Watson Farm. The Watson Farm is a 265-acre farm that was left to Historic New England, which is a large regional historic preservation organization. And our mission was to run the farm in the most sustainable manner while providing public programs and public access to this property. Presently at Watson Farm, we have about 120 head of primarily Red Devon cattle, uh, and we also have about 100 sheep. And we raise the Red Devon for 100% grass-fed uh, and finished beef that we sell to local markets. And the sheep are raised for grass-fed lamb, but also for the wool, for the blankets. My name is Rita Kenyon Nutilla. I'm a member of the Kenyon family that uh, owns Meadowburg Farm here in Richmond, Rhode Island. We have a dairy farm with about 110 cows all together. That includes young stock and, and uh, older animals. We have three different breeds of, of uh, animals. There are Jerseys, there are Guernseys, and there are Holsteins. Uh, different breeds uh, for different reasons, um, different amounts of milk, things like that. I grew up here. Uh, our kids are fourth generation to live here. Uh, my grandfather bought this place back in the uh, late 30s, early 40s. And, uh, you know, when I grew up, we had cows here, and I always had a couple dairy cows, and I showed dairy and 4 H and so on, and a few beef cows. And so it's been in the family a long time. We usually have between 25 and 30 uh, beef cows. Uh, we, we have a cow-calf operation, so we have a bull uh, with the cows, and all our, all our animals are born here. Uh, and then we, uh, we're involved in the Rhode Island Raised Livestock Association, um, and we, uh, we have our beef processed, and uh, we sell it here on, on the farm, and Heidi does go to one farmer's market. Uh, and then Heidi has a... a a bunch of different animals that she raises. I have a variety of chickens and the number changes depending on the time of year. Um, in the springtime I do a lot of field trips for school groups so I'm constantly hatching chicks um, so at times I've got a hundred chickens here. Um, fortunately in the winter we're down to around 30 so we have chickens mostly for laying eggs but I will raise chickens uh, for meat just for ourselves too. And then I have dairy goats, and I don't sell any dairy products like cheese or milk um, from the milk the goats give, but I make soap. I've got some sheep. Um, again, I try to keep a variety of animals for the kids who are coming for the field trip so that I can teach them a little bit about each kind of animal. And the wool from the sheep I use for various um, 
craft projects and we do some things in the summer with the wool with the kids who come for um, programs. We have a couple little ponies and pigs. oh and yeah and pigs yeah we raise um, two three four pigs a year too and that meat we also process through the Rhode Island Raised Livestock Association and we we sell that here too. The way we milk is very similar to what we used to milk. Oh, we haven't modernized that much. Naturally, there are all kinds of, of automation across the country. You know, you can have two farms side by side, and one person is a highly profitable individual, and the other person is barely eking out an existence. Profitability in farming is always a necessary part of sustainability. It has to be economically viable. We had an investment to uh, to, to get the farm so it was ours, and I tell people all the time when you if I went out there and started writing down my, my farm tractor and my mowing machine and my balers and my corn choppers and, and all that stuff and, and put the hours you put into it, is it profitable? Probably not. But we're, what, we're, what we're shooting for and what we're starting to see is it is starting to sustain itself. Will it ever be profitable? I don't know if I'm not going to retire and stay on the farm. I'd like to right now, but we can't do it yet, but maybe someday it's, it's something to shoot for. And I think the fact that we do a little bit of everything, you know, we've got the beef that's kind of year round. We got the maple syrup going in the spring. I, the field trips are very popular in the springtime. It's kind of that diversity. Uh, it helps to keep the money flowing right. and keep us going. Right. Multiple aspects of sustain sustainable farming, uh, the economic side of it, you can't have a sustainable or an environmentally friendly farm if it's not cost effective if you can't make money off of it there's no way that a farm's going to last the other side of that is by making it environmentally friendly and sustainable you can use that as a marketing tool to sell your product it's multifaceted in the fact that all these pieces need to come together in order for a sustainable small farm to become uh, effective and to last years the scale of food production in this country has gotten huge. And so the future agriculture that is sustainable, regional, sort of uh, decentralized from the industrial model, will have multi dimensions, many different sizes of farms. Someone can have a sustainable farm with six or eight acres of vegetables, or five acres of vegetables, or even three acres of vegetables, and they can, they can turn a profit on it. Um, access to the land is very important. Uh, land prices in this area are the highest in the country. And so those all have an impact on whether it's profitable or not. Uh, for us at Watson Farm, we're very fortunate that the owner left this property to a historic preservation organization. And so we've had access to this land for 30 years to develop a sustainable model for producing grass-fed beef. But it's, there's a potential for these direct marketing of greens, for instance, that someone could do unheated hoop greenhouses with remade plastic, grow greens, package it up and sell it at the farmer's market with uh, not much land and not much overhead and make it profitable and maybe even make a living out of, you know, maybe an acre or so. A lot of it has to do with your stewardship, the quality of your animals and the care and the time and the, that you put into it, okay? also returns you get off on the land. If you, if you maintain your property, you maintain your land, and you do it right, you're gonna be a lot more successful. You know, farming is 365 days a year, 24 seven. My brother and I have run this farm for a number of years. We seldom have time off. We have to, have to put a lot into this work. We don't make a lot of money. What we do is we um, increase our capital. We've got a, a quite a bit of land, things like that. People looking in say, oh, you're very well off. You've got all this land. You've got all this machinery and things to sell. But this is what we've worked for our whole life. For this place being 265 acres, um, you know, with restrictions not to be diversified, but just to be a cattle operation and sheep operation, uh, you know, it's, it's a little more of a challenge. Uh, just in terms of being specifically for livestock. But I've seen the pendulum swing, and today the demand for something that is raised in a, 
in a healthy manner is there's a huge demand for it so the consumer link is happening where consumers are willing to look and search out for people who are producing it in a, in a good way and, and, and pay a decent price for that. So that makes it a little bit more economical. I've noticed a big difference in the last few years. There, there, are, a lot of, there are a lot of small farms and, and right now, you know, buy local, eat local, it's a big thing. So that, that's very good for the, for the farms in Rhode Island, I, I would think. First obstacle would be if, if we were getting into farming would simply be the purchase. You would, you would require so much capital to get established. You'd have to buy the land. You'd have to buy the animals. You'd have to buy the machinery. Uh, so it's just a matter of getting that capital. So now the problem would probably be the services that we need. Perhaps the vet comes from Connecticut. We are not capable of, of uh, having the suppliers that we always need. Most of our purchases of machinery and things like that are from Connecticut, uh, Vermont, Pennsylvania. For them to compete economically against the larger Californian farms, um, farms in the Midwest, a lot of them have come together uh, and started corporations such as uh, Rody Meat um, and Rody Fresh. Um, and that allows multiple small farms to work together and produce a product that is not only sustainable and local, um, but that it also can be sold at a price comparable to that as the, of the larger farms. When Rody Fresh first got started, we weren't sure how this marketing would, venture would work. We've been very, very pleased with the turnaround. The average consumer is, is happy to buy a local product from us. Many of them um, made the connection with the, the uh, huge food chains such as Stop and Shop, things like that, and they actually pushed Stop and Shop to put our product into their store. They pushed the little Ma and Pa's to, to put our product on their shelves, things like that. So the, the consumer has certainly helped us tremendously in that. They, they want that local product. There is a savvy group of consumers out there who are saying, I want something that's more healthy. We first noticed when the movie Food Inc. came out, uh, a lot of people concerned about buying local. Um, and at the farmer's market, I am constantly answering questions of how is your animal raised? The consumer is very concerned that there's no hormones, um, no antibiotics in their meat, and concerned about how it's raised. Grass-fed is a big, big thing right now. And then since the egg um, episode with the salmonella, I've had a lot more people buying my eggs. Um, again, they just want to know where their food comes from, that it's local, and again, that the animals are treated humanely and, and fed and live in a more natural environment, you know, other than the cage. They, they love the free range um, method of raising animals, which is funny because I don't get as many eggs that way. I free range my chickens, but then I have to find the eggs, <laughs> too. We have the biggest market in the, in the country, right here. We have a third of the population within 100 miles. And those people want safe and healthy food. We need to recreate two areas, the size of the agricultural land in California, and redistribute that all across America. And in Rhode Island, that means we need 3,700 more acres in order to produce all of the fruits and vegetables that every person in our population needs. That's a great number. That's a doable number. And so down the road, this local food movement is, uh, is got a potential to supply a larger amount of our food supply. I actually think, you know, farming for Rhode Island, I think it looks good. I mean, I think so all these uh, groups uh, definitely uh, have an effect. And, and I'm noticing, uh, you know, for a long time, I'd go to a lot of these meetings, and I was like the young guy there, and uh, I'm definitely not the young guy anymore. There's a lot of young, there's a lot of young people uh, who, who are trying to, get, trying to get involved in farming. For young people coming along, you know, there's a lot of land trust in existence now that their concern is about preserving open space. And those land trusts or different methods that occur to preserve land, there needs to be ways that young people can access that land. For a land trust to receive a piece of property, that's a good thing, it's a wonderful thing. But they need to take it to the next level and have management plans for that preserved land and 
somehow have some method by which young people can access that land. We're basically going back to the way farming was done in the 40s, 50s, even up into the 60s, going back to the, the homegrown, smaller farms that don't produce large amounts of waste. You know, it's very important to Heidi and I that our animals are, are uh, you know, I tell people happy, comfortable. Uh, you know, we have animals because we like animals. We, we, don't, uh, we don't have the animals because uh, it's, it's a money grab. It's, it's because we enjoy having animals and uh, Heidi and I were lucky enough to meet each other or fall in love or whatever. And we both like the same things. Uh, you know, we can be here on the farm and Heidi can be in her chicken yard and I can be out in the field. And uh, that's what makes us successful because the things I don't like to do, you know, Heidi, Heidi does. And we really do it because we really like it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We don't. We you know we don't belong to the to a golf club. Uh, we don't have fancy sports cars uh, or any of that stuff. Our farm is you know what we enjoy to do. I like to say that if we can shorten the distance between the farm gate and the dinner plate, uh, there's more economic viability there for farmers. I think that there's a real future. You know, one of the things here in New England that we have to realize is land is somewhat scarce and it's difficult to, to eke out an existence, but people want safe and healthy food. So exploiting, and I do mean exploiting, and massaging that, that clientele is really important. Marketing is a big factor, and we can do it. We can do it. I can't tell if it's real. Just a spell, tell me, baby, is it? Cause I can't tell the baby, is it? Cause I can't tell the baby, is it? Cause I can't tell